Aloha. Aloha. Thank you for having me. Um, like Chris said, my name is Jarrett Makai Moku. I'm a resource teacher of the Honolulu District, uh, primarily working with counselors um, on 504s and any real counseling issues, but also on MTSS, um, some special ed, and we do work with the behavioral health side too, so our BHSs um, that service our district schools. Um, Today I'm going to just give a little bit background about 504. As we're going along, if you have some questions, please, um, if it pertains to what I'm talking about, then yes, ask away. If it's not, we'll have some time at the end too. Um, if you do have any like specific case type of questions, I'll be here after. I can talk to you folks about that and I'll make sure you get my email at the end too. Because like Chris said, I work with Honolulu District, but I am i don't care. If you're from any kind of school, I can help you if you want the help. So I do have contacts in the Leeward schools, Winward, Central, Outer Island, so um, please don't hesitate on, on that. Um, my background, I started as a school counselor in the Honolulu District. I was a counselor at Alawai Elementary, if any of you are familiar with that school is, um, right in Waikiki there. Uh, I was there for 11 years and I've been at the district now for seven. So um, through my years I've done many 504s, Nice easy ones where the parents are happy and the schools are happy and then we've had contentious ones with lawyers and irate parents and, and those cases. So I've, I've seen the gamut of it. I still help the schools when they um, have pressing needs and will still attend some meetings but we try to be more proactive and do trainings and, and have opportunities for, for conversations so that um, as we go along uh, the 504 isn't a burden but rather a, a, a benefit for the school and for the students. So, um, before, as we start, I just, these two words I'm going to say a lot, disability and discrimination. So as we're going along, just kind of keep those in your head when, when you guys get back to your schools and you do have 504 students that might come up, just kind of think about that too, the dis disability and the discrimination. So I do have a short video that I'm going to play, um, and it actually relates somewhat to the, our 504s, but just kind of look at this. As, as our society and, and how we look at people and especially people with disabilities. That video, the Orlando shooting was back in 2016 in June. So this came out in January of 2017 near the Pro Bowl in Orlando. Mm -hmm. So you know traditional kiss cams, man, woman, it's throughout the sports world and good looking people and whatnot. So they changed it up and they just really added a um, to look at across the what we look at labels and different people. So just with that in mind, our, our, our 504 you know, especially in Hawaii, that's the kind of students we work with, all different colors, different backgrounds. Um, and as we're looking at 504, just remembering that the, the real basis on this is recognizing the students that have a disability and making sure as a school we're not discriminating against for that disability. Okay. Um, it does get a little gray in defining a disability, what is a disability, an ailment and whatnot, and hopefully as I go through it that'll be answered a little bit more. But that is the underlying real theme is we don't want these students to be discriminated against because they have this certain condition. And um, as we go through it, hopefully um, it, it'll be clearer. So some historical context. Um, Section 504 started in the year 1973. Anyone remember what was going on in our civil and social unrest in 1973? Any guesses? <coughs> Well, 1973 was the ending of the Vietnam War, okay, or the Vietnam War was still going on, but it was still the, the political big hot button issue at the time, and the soldiers were returning home, and they couldn't even get jobs. Um, they were being discriminated against because they're in the war, because they might have had different mental um, disabilities, they might have had physical type of impairments, and even the government wouldn't hire them for certain things. So in 1973, Congress made the Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. And so no one with a disability, okay, be excluded from, denied the benefits of, or subjected to discrimination under any program or activity re receiving federal assistance. So this actually started our, our Section 504 as we know it today, it really started as a civil rights law. Okay? It didn't start as an education-based law. Through the years, it's, it's changed and it's been amended, um, but it did start out as being a non-discriminatory -disc civil rights law. And affects us now because it's anywhere federal funding is applied. So traditional schools, charter schools, um, to an extent public universities, okay? Um, our private school partners, Puno, Yolani, Kwemea, 
uh, even the, the smaller private schools, they don't necessarily have to follow 504 because they're not receiving funds for their students to operate, okay? Um, there are a few cases where we'll um, evaluate some of those private school students, but it doesn't necessarily mean the schools will follow the plan. Um, now, so the beginnings of Section 504 helped pave a way for the 1990s American with Disabilities Act, or ADA. So oftentimes you'll see ADA attached to 504, you also see it attached to special education type of cases. Um, and in tw 2008, they made revisions to this ADA. And I'm going to speak to that because once these revisions were made, it's our current state of 504 now, where really the floodgates can be wide open to anyone looking um, to, to be recognized as having Section 504 benefits there. Um, and of course, you all know it's an unfunded mandate. So the federal government does not provide funding to the schools. And this is across the board. Um, sometimes our state or our district will be able to find certain monies for funding and whatnot, but it's not like special education where you're getting a certain amount of money due to having a uh, certain child or, or positions with that. Okay? So again, the intent of 504 is to provide this access and opportunity for the students with disabilities the same as the students without. So access is a, a word you'll hear a lot. So you're providing our student who needs these uh, modifications and accommodations to access the same type of learning that his or her counterparts are getting. Okay? And this will include during a school day, it includes field trips, it includes summertime if you're offering it to all the students. So that's something to remember too. Okay? Um, and again, back to our disabilities and discrimination, um, providing these aids, benefits, services. This one is important, does not guarantee equal outcomes. Sometimes parents think, okay, my son's getting a D, he, he's got ADHD, okay, we're gonna put him on a 504, and this is gonna fix his grade. That's not true, okay? Students might come on their 504, but you can always let the parents know. You're giving the opportunity, but it doesn't guarantee the outcome, okay? You're not gonna turn a D into an A just because they're a 504. They still have to do the work, they still have to attend school, they still have to do all those things. Now, as far as educational component, um, student has to have a physical or mental impairment, okay? And once this is identified, and if a student is going through our referral and evaluation process, then the student is already covered under the protection of 504, even if they're not made 504 yet, okay? If they're going through the evaluation, the eligibility, the plan portion still, once they're signed in under the referral or, or um, parent consent, then they are covered again. So our 504 process, I'm gonna go through and talk about the process of the students and I'll also show you folks some of the DOE um, uh, documents that we do use. Because it, it's, it's like a, a, a two-step process and you have your real world meetings in school, you'll have your meetings with the teachers, the family members, um, and then you have like your inputting part into our system in ECSSS. And so I'm going to try and juggle between both so you can kind of just see the path and how these students um, go through it to be Section 504. Any questions so far? Okay. So our referral process, okay, and I'm sure in many of your schools it's the same. Who, who oftentimes is the one referring for an evaluation, let's say? Teacher is one. Parent, yes, and we've seen the parent one much more prevalent now, um, especially if a student goes to a doctor and a doctor says, uh, you should go see the school for Section 504 services. The parent might not know anything about 504. The doctor might not even know anything. We've seen referrals where it says Section, uh, section 502. You know, the, the doctor doesn't even have it correct. So as a school, um, SSC, administrator, counselor, teacher, if someone comes to you with these referrals, it has to be acted upon, okay? Like 10, 15 years ago, we used to look at 504s more as, okay, what can we do in the classroom? Let's say it's a small elementary, what can we fix in these settings if there's a learning problem? Now, if someone comes for a referral, then the school has to act on that, okay? The, the, the general public, the medical field, just in general, um, is a lot more aware of the different uh, processes to become eligible or to be looked at or evaluated. So if a referral comes in and there's a suspicion of a disability, any of our major life activities, okay, 
then the referral must go through. And again, a parent or the school can request it too. Now, in the DOE, if a referral does come in, it's 15 calendar days from when it comes in. So what I stress to our schools in Honolulu is that if it comes in to you folks, and if it comes into a counselor or a teacher, that teacher or counselor or office, let's say, they have to have a central point of contact. So hopefully your school has someone you know that this form will go to, and it won't just be signed by the counselor and sit on her desk, and two weeks later she tells the principal, oh, I'll have this referral that's been sitting here. Because once that referral is signed, it starts this 15 calendar day process. So it's really, really good to have this type of system and if you haven't seen it before, this is what our Form 101 looks for, what it looks like, a request for evaluation. And kind of funny thing about this, and as we kind of go along, and Chris mentioned we'll be talking about SPED a little bit at the end, but 504 generally follows the SPED protocols, SPED timelines, because okay? 504 does not have their own set of, of um, guidelines. We generally have copied SPED guidelines. So when a request comes in, technically, the school shouldn't be predetermining if the kid's going to be 504 or special ed. But as educators, we know these things coming in, we're going to go one way or the other most of the time. Mm -hmm. It's pretty obvious. Okay? So when it does come in, it doesn't initially say 504 evaluation. It just says a request for evaluation. So if a parent does come in with a request, then we have to honor that. Our 15 calendar days, um, I'm not sure if... You correct my terminology with, with charter schools. I don't know if you folks call it SFT meeting too, our student focused team meeting. So um, that has to happen with our parent. Now, what we often will tell our schools, and it's not in here and I, it's not in the literature, but especially a case where it's kind of up in there, we, we, we tell the schools to have staffing meetings. So that's pre parent. So the parent not involved in that. So the school just can kind of get on base, touch bases together. So when you come sit down in a meeting, it's not like, who are we talking about? What's the, the student's fine? You know, those are the kind of things you really want to avoid when working with our 504 cases because we want everyone to be on the same page, know the student, know the issues, as well as the school kind of having like a unified front when they're going to and, and evaluating. So when we're looking at this, um, staffing's always good to be prepared. Um, our student-focused team meeting with our parents. Um, there are two important things here, kind of legal type of things, are rights of the students, and the parents, so um, anyone know who should be passing this out during our meeting? Yes, thank you. It should be our admin, okay? Whoever the admin, if the admin's not there, it should be the admin designee, okay? But every time it should be the administrator, okay? Not the counselor, unless the counselor is sitting on another meeting and being the admin designee, okay? Not the teacher. Um, if the parent doesn't want it, it's okay. You can say you don't have to take it because they've probably had many of these. But every meeting we have our parent student rights be presented. Um, and then as the stages go along, this is our prior written notice. And I'm sure you folks are familiar with this. It does sound kind of funny um, when you're initially looking at it. Anybody want to take a stab? Prior written notice. What, what is our prior written notice telling our parent at each step? What we're intending to do. What the school is going to do in this specific step for their child. Okay. So as we go along in all our different sections that I had earlier, we're going to do a prior written notice to let the parent know what's going to happen at each step, our evaluation step, our eligibility step, and then at the end, our plan. Okay. So it does go down. There's about six lines in here, but it really is saying what the school is going to do. Yeah, it'll automatically populate. What our SPED guys are doing now, our SPED yeah, RTs, wow. now they're saying to cross it out and put in whoever the um, administrator at the meeting is. For now at 504, we've just said just leave it. You know, if the school, if the principal wants to run it that way, they can. But 504, we don't have any strict guidelines in that way. So although the, the SPED guys are doing it now, we're kind of just saying as long as there's an admin representative there, that's why it's so important to have an admin designee that um, knows what he or she is doing. Okay. So thank you for that question. Um, you know, the, actually what we write and filling those things out, we have a whole like half day on how to fill out the PWNs and I'm not going to go into that today as insofar as all the different steps. But just know that as we're doing our meeting, these are things to keep in mind on what's going to happen. Now, 
504 team. Um, just shout it out or raise your hand. Who should be on our 504 teams? Parents. Parents. Work with the kids. Who else? Teachers. Teachers. The kids sometimes, yes, thank you. If, it, if it's applicable, admin for sure. If it's applicable for the student to be there, yes. Counselor. counselor. Oftentimes, um, in all of my schools mostly, the counselors are the care coordinator for our 504 students. So if your counselor is the care coordinator, then they should be on it with a case. If sometimes it's the SAC, sometimes it might be a special ed teacher, then definitely they should be there too. Um, what we try to emphasize also is that if the counselor is the care coordinator for this meeting, the counselor should not be the admin designee also. That kind of double roles can get very um, ugly if, let's say, this case goes to court or a lawyer comes in and says, okay, why, why is there no admin there? Oh, the counselor. No, the counselor is the care coordinator in charge of the case. The principal or designee should be there. So we try to stress that. Um, also, if you have like a brand new, let's say you have two counselors and you have a brand new counselor Who's, not, who's gonna be the designee, then make sure they know our brand new teacher. Make sure they know what that means about being the designee at the meeting, okay? But yes, anyone who has knowledge of the student, um, and we try as much as we can to have the parent there. Um, there's a famous special ed case that has gone through um, the courts and whatnot because the parent felt like they did not have the opportunity to be there. So we try to tell all of our schools as much as you can have the parent there, even worst case if it's on a speakerphone, on a conference call, whatever, that way. If not, then get in writing the reason why the parent can't come. But this is our 504 team and it oftentimes follows what we say with our SPED students. Um, sometimes people say, does the principal have to be there? And in the past we just we used to say yes, but now we just try to emphasize have a competent designee. The principal can't be there. I know it's impossible to some of our larger schools or with meetings and whatnot. So, so our referral comes in and this leads into our first step, which is our evaluation process. So now you're evaluating your student, okay? In the past, the SFT is called a SST. Now they changed the name a little bit, SFT. But really in 504, we're looking at the data you folks have at your school. So unlike special ed, we're not really gonna go in and order our assessments by our maybe district or our, our, our school personnel. With 504s, we try to emphasize looking at all of the data you have, which may be grades, okay, attendance, office referrals for behavior. Um, ask the parent if they went to the doctor recently what the doctor's report is. Uh, if they're already seen an outside provider in some realm. Um, anything that you folks can get will, is used as our evaluation data. Can you order assessments in this 504 process? Yeah, you could, but you make sure that you have your district or your school staff involved in these meetings because if it just comes out of the blue that you want a big um, type of uh, behavior assessment done by your clinical psychologist or something, then that person should be involved from the very beginning. And you might be even looking at higher level services if it's gonna go through assessments. So just kind of remember that too. When you're evaluating your students, you want to draw on everything you already have, okay? And a good thing by doing this is it expedites the process. Oftentimes, if you're in a situation where you have to um, evaluate a student, especially due to behavior, if you have all your data ready, you can go through this process quick to make this student um, qualified. If you order an assessment, how long might it take before you even get it back? Yeah. At least 40, some days 60, okay? So with that, if you have this case sitting here and a parent wants something and you want to bring in a big assessment, two months later, you're meeting again, the parent's not going to be very happy and probably the teacher's not going to be happy if they're working with a student that has a lot of these um, higher end behaviors, okay? And then I'll, I'll skip to these forms. They're just, we have consent forms on all these levels for your evaluation, um, whether you're getting an assessment or not. If, usually we don't have assessments, so we don't usually have to do these forms. So we have our meeting. The big question in our evaluation is what? Yeah. Are we going to evaluate? That is the big question in, in our evaluation portion. Are we going to evaluate this student to be 504? Okay. Or are we going to say, no, we're not going to evaluate? Okay. Or on the flip side, are we going to evaluate the student for special education? Then it's a whole different process, right? Just looking at 504, and oftentimes, if we're here at evaluation, our answer is yes. 
okay, almost 100% of the time, you're going to evaluate the student because this concern has been raised, whether it's by the parent, whether it's by a really concerned teacher, whether it's by an administrator. Okay? So we strongly, strongly suggest that we do evaluate the student. So that's going to take us to our eligibility portion. Like I said earlier, I think I used the word floodgate. That might have been a proper term, but our eligibility will look at all these physical or mental impairments that a student could be affected against. And as we're looking at just this, this list here, as you can see, this basically covers everything from head to toe and inside and out, okay? Um, emotional or mental illness, a little bit harder to show, but definitely more prevalent now in these last few years, you know. Um, mental or physi physiological disorder also, but we're really looking at that list, and I have some later, but it's a major activity in life. So something, a basic activity that an average person can do with little or no difficulty. If a student is having a hard time in any of these, then that can be a qualifying factor, okay? Prior to 2008, we really looked at learning to qualify, and this is like our major huge true or false question. So does the student have to have, or does the student's learning have to be affected to be eligible for 504? Okay. And the answer is no. Okay. So just remember that, write that down somewhere. Learning does not have to be affected because schools throughout the state, still, I still get emails every week. Okay, we can't prove that it's affecting his learning. You don't have to prove it's affecting his learning. We have all these other things that it's affecting. Okay? Caring for oneself, performing tasks, walking, seeing, hearing, speaking, breathing, learning, working, eating, lifting, bending, standing, sleeping, communicating, concentrating, thinking, reading. And they even put in other. So, if you have a student doing something really peculiar or not on this list, you can add them in as other. Okay? So, you know, we, we do have some really high-functioning autistic students who do not qualify for special education anymore. But this other might be social skills, social interactions, those type of things. So we had a mini conference in 504 earlier this year, and one of the things that the lawyer study was doing was that because a lot of times we get those kids who aren't going to qualify for special ed, either their IQ is too low but not low enough, mm -hmm. that because they have a sub-average score that they can qualify for 504 and get the accommodations like because it affects their thinking as they documented. Mm -hmm. and so like automatically we're like running around trying to get kids on these plans. Yeah, so that's something that we deal with a lot now is our students in special education, due to special education becoming stricter, becoming um, people really looking at the disability guidelines. Maybe they're being rescinded from special education mm -hmm. or not qualifying for special education and then being put in as under Section 504. My only warning with that is it should take time through the process. It shouldn't be immediately after when the kid is rescinded at that same meeting, you tell the parent, oh, by the way, we're going to make him 504, and then try to cram all of his IEP um, activities and whatnot in a 504 plan. If you're going to think about rescinding and then going 504, it has to take place another meeting. You have to do another referral. And it is, a, it is somewhat of a lengthier process to do it that way, but it does come out much cleaner in that you're not just jumping from one to the other. Okay? So... You know, going from 504 to special education, we rarely hear any type of grumbling because it's an easier process where they're going from lesser services to more services. But whenever you tell a parent they're going to go from all these services to school-focused services, that's a, that's a big difference. Okay? So just remember that when you're looking at this process too. But yeah, this is a way how, like you said, any type of issue a student could have. We just reminded that this still gets all the, all the accommodations they could get. A lot of times what we see is kids still need those accommodations, but they don't necessarily need the goals they don't need. Yeah. So that helps ease the parents into the fight. So. And, and the real big thing, I'll get into it later too, but to her point is that our special ed, I mean a lot of the instruction happens in the resource room, the pull-out rooms. Our 504s, all the instruction are where? Okay. Classroom setting. Okay, the general classroom setting is where our 504s are getting their learning, but it's also where they're getting their modifications, accommodations, okay? So that is one of the huge differences between special education and Section 504. 
The 504 kids shouldn't be in your sped classrooms jumping in on a sped lesson. Okay, it happens. Uh, sometimes sped EAs get pulled to be working one-on-one -on -one in 504 kids. Hey, it happens at the school. I'm not, I'm not going to go in there and physically tell you not to do it, but it should not, according to the process and, and the way that the funds are passed out and whatnot, 504 kids should be in the general ed setting. And again, just more um, looking at the overall picture, all of these, 2008, they changed it so these are all covered now too. So these health issues is our big push now in, in Honolulu as far as identifying our kids, our students who have some of these health issues and making sure that even though it's not necessarily affecting their learning, they can sit there and, and, and um, academically and cognitively listen to the teacher and do the assignments they have an issue with balls or incontinence where they can't feel themselves go to the restroom. So every hour they have to go to the health room and, and sit on the toilet and they come back. And that time that that student misses, okay, that's our discrimination point that I made earlier. That student should not be penalized for leaving the classroom because he has a physical type of disability. So those are really the ones in your schools. If you know of a kid who sometimes we have students who are deaf in one eye, I mean, pardon me, blind in one eye or deaf in one ear. And then these kids have nothing, no plan, they're not even identified. So those are the kind of kids that we should be identifying as 504, just to make sure that when they go from grade to grade or teacher to teacher, that people know these students have this type of disability. Uh, so the schools can help them as much as they can. So those are the kind of ones, and I'll talk about it more in a little bit, but just keep your eyes out for those students, okay? Our boy who's running on flying chairs and not listening, pretty obvious. He's been getting help and aid and accommodation since he was first grade. Our quiet girl who you might not know a history, you know, we have to look at those and see. Maybe there's something, maybe there's a physical issue to this. So 504 now does really cover all of these physical issues too. Not just emotional, not just behavioral, not just learning, but also physical, okay? So as a team, we're looking. Our team comes back together, takes all our evaluation data, okay? Now, does this student have a physical or mental impairment? So who makes this decision? It's the team, okay? So you as a team, that's why the staffing is important, that's why our SFT is important, that's why looking at this data is important because we are the educational professionals, we make this decision. Now sometimes you folks get 504s from other schools and they're like, holy crap, why is this kid 504? There's no way, he doesn't show anything in our school. But he was made 504 by a team at a previous educational facility. So in that way, we have to respect that. We can't just toss it out and say, okay, you know, he's at your charter school, now he's at your, your charter school, I don't agree with it, he's done. We still have to follow this process, okay? So that's what the important part of our team comes through, okay? Um, again, we have all types of different forms that, that the DOE will, will go through. I do have this form. If, if your school, for some reason, is having a hard time putting all this type of information together um, for the student, there are some easy forms on ECSSS, I can get them to Chris, that, that a counselor or that a teacher could pre-fill out prior to coming to our SFT or staffing, where we really look at what the life activities are, um, what supports a student already getting. So you kind of go through it and this will help with your eligibility. Um, you know, there's so many things on there that's on the plan as far as mitigating measures and accommodations and whatnot. Um, so that is a good one we do have, as well as once you do make the student eligible, this is what the eligibility determination shows. And again, this is all filled out on ECSSS, and so most of you have seen this, but this is the form that would happen during our initial. So the steps I'm talking about is during the initial evaluation, okay? Um, so when it comes to, I just want to clarify too. Sure. So when it comes to mitigating measures, when it comes to the eligibility part, we have to treat it as though there were no mitigating measures when it comes to the plan, we can write it. Yeah, so good question. So mitigating measures, a term that's come up again since 2008 a lot. So looking at the easiest ones to, to kind of think of is your really hyper um, ADHD boy who's on medicine now and he's so much better in class. Can we look at him and make him eligible for Section 504? And the obvious answer is yes, because with mitigating measures, his medicine is, is mitigating his condition. So you have to kind of look at him, how would he act without mm -hmm. his medication? Same thing, maybe a student with a wheelchair, okay? How would she get from class to class if she didn't have this wheelchair, okay? Um, hearing aids, 
I don't know, glasses wasn't it, but I'm not too sure. But there is a whole list of mitigating measures. So that is really something to think about. How um, the I student. He said nothing with the, because he brought up glasses too. Yeah, I don't think glasses and count. Glasses don't count yeah. everybody. Yeah, glasses don't count because a lot of people have glasses. Yeah. Right. Um, and going back to this <laughs> sheet here, um, I, don't, I don't have it right up now, but in ECSSS, if you go under the referral tab where all this information will be, for the student, it'll say student summary report. I use that a lot to especially look at students. If I get calls from schools, I don't know who these students are. They're not my students. So even as an administrator or an SAC, you might not be in the classroom all the time. If you just hit that student summary, it'll bring up everything. It'll have their grades. It'll have any past behavior issues. So that one's a good one that I, I tell our counselors and administrators to look at too. Now, I'm going through this quickly, but as you can kind of see, we, in our SPED, our, if you've been involved in a special education process, this takes a lot longer, right? Our referral comes in, we have our meeting here in our 15 days, assessments ordered, we have another 45 to 60 days here to do this. If eligible, then we'll do the plan. In 504, this is like super speed. You can do all of this in one meeting, okay? And as you get more, as a student does become eligible and you're doing more of your yearly or your every three, re, three year review, you should really be doing these one type of meeting. Okay? Because oftentimes we get hung up when we have multiple meetings and things are done here and they're not completed here. So just kind of remember that at 504. Um, if you're new to it, then, then you know, talk to someone who has experience, watch how they run a meeting, or if you have a new staff member. Um, but once we get to our other portion, and just to go off a little bit, the, the major thing with, through all of this is just that a lot of it comes back to your relationship with your parent okay, and your student, knowing your student. Um, if the counselor is the care coordinator, he or she should meet with the student at the beginning of the year, touch bases with them. If they're a new student, talk to them when they come in. You know, want to know I'll talk to the parents, say hi to the parent. When you have your meetings, it's easy. You call the parent, hey, hi, this is Mr. Doyle. I'm going to be uh, review. We have a review for your son's. 504 plan, what days work for you, okay, perfect, come and do it. If you don't have any type of connection or, the, or the, the admin or the teacher will come in and sit in a meeting not even know who the kid is, and sometimes those meetings, those issues come up a lot more. So really stressing the relationship component between the school and the family. Try to emphasize that. Okay, so our plan, <coughs> student comes in, we look at the eligibility, can... We make the student eligible, we say yes. So now this is the meat of it, yeah, our accommodations and modifications. So this is what the school is going to do. Okay? In our regular education settings, what the school is going to do to address the concerns and needs of the student, to make sure that student comes up okay, the same access as our other students. Um, this just really quickly shows just some samples um, of modifications and accommodations. These could be endless, you know. Some of the ones we always see are, what are some of the, the more typical ones you always see? <coughs> yeah, extra time, we have seating, yeah. Um, you know, for our students who might have physical ailment, ailments, you know, having, facing the teacher or the good, with the, the eye that has vision or the ear. Um, what we try to stress now, too, is if you're gonna put extended time, don't just leave it extended time wide open. Maybe extended time up until a week past the standard due date or extended time two weeks prior or end of the quarter, whatever it is. You don't want a student coming in the third quarter, parents saying, oh, I'm gonna bring, my son has extended time, I'm gonna bring all his first quarter work, okay? So try to talk to those parents that extended time, yes, on assignments, but this extended time doesn't mean endless. There is still a deadline um, depending on that student's disability, okay? Um, sometimes here, and I touched on it a little bit, but like asthma, okay? Asthma, if we have students who, asthma, and it's so bad that they miss school and something, and I'll go over it a little bit later, but let's make sure that our accommodations are consistent with that disability of being asthma, okay? Which if, if asthma is the main condition for the students 504, we shouldn't have all kinds of other type of um, accommodations in there that aren't related to that type of asthma um, services, okay? So this, this is just an example here, just tons. I mean, your teachers or your counselor could go in and just Google. I mean, you have stuff for cancer, bipolar, 
There's so many different disabilities in here that does show it. But it really should come back to what the school can provide. Okay? Again, we don't have money. There's no money. Nobody's giving you, you know, 10 grand for each 504 kid and you guys decide out what you do with it. Right? There's no money. So it has to come from the district, the school. It has to come from um, sometimes adjusting people, personnel in the school. And, and that just happens with that. Okay. Um, Again, regional accommodations, but there are areas like skilled nursing. We can't provide that through our 504. It's health aid. Transportation, someone breaks their hip and is out, um, can't walk for three months or some extent of that. You can get transportation for those type of disabilities too, okay, if they're um, made 504. Of course, counseling, usually through the BHS or the counselor. And again, looking at our non-academic settings. Okay, that's really important now too, after school, Talking to the A+, plus, let them know that the student does have some disabilities and this and that, okay? Um, the related service is a little bit more intense. You don't always see them on 504 plans, but just make sure that you have the frequency. Um, if you haven't seen what the plan looks like, uh, the actual plan itself, the document, just basically has all of the students' accommodations in the middle here, and if they do have related service, it's on the bottom with annual goals. Statewide testing, that's also something to discuss during a 504 student's um, evaluation and plan process, just to make sure that um, whatever type of accommodations they're getting in the classroom, they're also getting that during their testing, okay? So we don't want to limit a student and say, no, you can't do this because it's a standardized test. If the student is getting these certain behavioral modifications or academic modifications in the classroom, they should be able to get it in their testing. Our review once a year, okay, our annual review, our reeval is every three years. Now, to go ahead and change, let's say, some of the modifi modifications, related service, do you have to have an, a reevaluation? No, you can do it in your annual review, okay? The reeval is just to make sure that when you go in and look at it, if there's major changes that you're thinking about changing the placement or, or huge behavioral type of issues or, or a, a degrad degradation in health or something, and then now you look at a reval, look at everything bigger. But your periodic review is just to make sure that everything is still in place and then the student, you know, once a student is made eligible for 504, it's going to be hard to really make them not eligible unless the consent is withdrawn or, or, or some types of circumstances there. Okay. What about revision? If you had to revise the plan or whatnot, then you would just do it as the annual review. So. The reval date would stay the same three years in the future, but if you make revisions, it'll change its review date to when your current newest revision. So sometimes people are like, oh, I don't want to, we're scared to um, revise it because it's going to change the review date. But you can do it in, let's say, the review date's not till April. You make a revision in December, that's fine. You can always meet again if the parent wants or the school wants to and do another revision or another review. Yeah, so the review always resets whenever your last meeting. But that's okay because you can have as many of these as you'd want, okay? So if you are going to go in and make a revision or some type of review earlier in the year, then it's fine. Um, sometimes if a student, we recommend that if a student comes from like one complex to another or let's say island to island, sometimes the accommodations might not match up at your school. Right? Let's say there's some sort of specific tutoring program or some sort of... Um, um, you know, modification they're getting, it doesn't apply to your school at all. Once the student's enrolled, you don't have to go through the whole re-eval process. You can just go in and revise it and then check in again later and do it. Um, so that is a, a, a good benefit of having the annual review. Of course, exiting, there's many different ways. Re-eval to say they're not eligible. If a student graduates, um, if a student leaves the public school system, okay, so this is if they're going to go to, oops, sorry, private school, mainland, whatnot, okay, they'll, they'll be taken out. And when they come back, if they do come back to you, let's say you'd have to just do it as an initial or a reval again. Um, this bottom one touched on a little bit, but if a 504 student is found eligible now for special education, special education kind of eats the kid whole. Right? It's just like it takes whatever is in the 504 plan and it encompasses it in that special education IDEA um, plan, okay? Their IEP should include the necessary concerns that are in the 504. 
Now, you can need temporary impairments, concussions, um, pre-post-pregnancy complications, broken bones. Let's say these are only for six months, six months. You can make a student eligible for that time frame. Okay, pregnancy is not considered um, eligibility for 504, but if the student, let's say, has to stay out for six months due to that after, then you could potentially go ahead, have your team meeting, look at it. Okay, and then once the student's health gets better or whatnot, then they can come back and you can take it off. Okay, same thing, like I said, broken bones, concussion, sometimes illnesses. Um, if in all cases we try to avoid too much home hospital instruction, I know you folks have that too, but the home hospital instruction gets really touchy with our, our students out on anxiety or, or those kind of issues because they, we, we eventually end up losing them. They're not being able to, to really get the services they need. So we stress as much as we can saving the home hospital for sicknesses, illnesses, those kind of things, not mental type of cases. Um, Kind of here on the bottom are EAPs, emergency action plans. Um, if you have students, just because they have an emergency action plan due to some health type of issue, it doesn't make a 504 unnecessary, okay? Um, what that really means is that looking at the student's frequency, intensity, and complexity of their risk factor is the main thing to say if they're okay just on an emergency action plan or if they should also have a 504 plan. And that's for the protection of the student but also for the school too, okay? So um, easy case of this is a peanut allergy, okay? So your turn now. Should all students with peanut allergies be on a 504 plan? Okay, I see some shaking heads, good. No, it depends on how frequent the student would get it, how intense the student's reaction would be and how complex and the risk, risk factors are, okay? If a student is gonna, if a student ingests peanuts and immediately needs his EpiPen and could die, then that student probably should be on a 504 band. But now if a student touches peanuts and just gets a small rash, then that's maybe something there's an emergency action plan can cover, okay? Our higher level, if you have higher level cases with students and health type of issues, then they definitely should be looked at, okay? Uh, students who cannot control their body temperature regulation, right? Those students should not be running two miles in PE if they could overheat and have to go to the hospital. You know, those, any type of kind of fragile students, any type of those things, those should be looked at 504. Asthma, students missing large amounts of time because of asthma, okay? If a student has asthma and is only missing, you know, a few days a year because of it or not any time at all, maybe just has their inhaler at school, then that student probably doesn't need to be on a 504 plan. But if that student, every time there's, like we had Vogue in the past or Kona winds or something happens, they're out for a week, then that, those are the cases we should be looking at. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions on health, health type issues? Okay, and again, those are the main factors that should be looked at um, for there. Well, I'm almost out, but this slide shows a big differences between 504 and special education, okay? All right, funded versus unfunded, all right? Our, our IDEA provides these educational services for these students who qualify. Um, 504 present, uh, prevents our students from being discriminated against. Um, general education for our 504 kids, IDEA, the LRE, okay? We just put monetary damages up there. You know, never seen a case in Hawaii where they're gonna come and just sue you as a counselor because they don't agree with your case, but we have seen cases where it's the superintendent and then the principal's name and all of that. And, and that's a whole different story. But the point is to just, like we talked about the process, follow that process at your school when working with your 504 kids, okay? okay kind of funny, but we put things on here, right? things not to say in a 504 meeting, so busy I can't do accommodations, I didn't know your child was a 504. And these are taken from actual meetings, okay? Teachers like, wait, what is 504? Okay, this one, we all, sometimes we hear, nothing is wrong with him, or he's so good in my class, okay? So these are where, if you know you have a teacher who might say some of these things, this is when you might have a staffing, talk to them on the side, show them what the school is thinking, what the parent expects, okay? And then just, if you have that, that, that downer teacher who's just so negative, like, oh, he doesn't come to school with his pencil, and he comes dirty, like, 
We really want to avoid those negative words during these meetings. They're trying to make a positive, get through the meeting, make sure that you can, um, you know, suffice the, the parent and the school and not be negative. Okay, what else I got in it? In closing. Yeah. So really, if, if um, looking at just our overall national trends, 504s are on the rise because we have so many factors now, not only learning where they where they can be impacted. So our teachers coming in, they might not be training our new teachers on 504s, let's say, in their program. So as an administrator or SAC, if you, if you have teachers coming in, and might be able to explain for them. Right, or counselors. Like when I started counseling, nobody told me anything. They just gave me a plan and we kind of figured it out how to run meetings and whatnot. So, you know, th through, through that and um, can, just audio. Can you give a copy of this slide? Yeah. For, the, for that specific reason. Yeah. Like when you bring it on board, no counselors. This is, this is exactly the stuff that we gotta. Yeah, I'll give it to Chris and then you can, um, you can um, put in your Google or whatever. And then we have the emails for this specific session. Yeah. And then, yeah, if you guys have any, any quick questions now, I know almost out of time. Yes? I recently went to a different training, and they presented the idea of, for goals, for the percentage. You know how you have a four out of five opportunities, or 80% of the time. Mm -hmm. They said, why are we holding our kids to that standard when a passing grade is, say, 70%? Mm -hmm. So what's your take on that? Well, I, I think... The most important thing is you have the person at the meeting too writing the goals because sometimes we do have people at the meetings, uh, it might be the BHS or it might be other individuals and they're not even at the meeting. But I think if the school talks to the provider kind of beforehand and then they have a basic understanding, then I think that, that's the main thing. Um, as far as specifically being 80 or 100 or 70, I think it depends on the student, um, depends on the administrator too because sometimes the principal might want it to be only 80 or 70, and sometimes they might want it 100, you know. Five out of five times, Johnny will say hi to his teacher, you know, or respect the administrator or whatnot. If it's only three out of five times, and that's something, if that's pre-discussed, then that, that might be the improvement from zero times, right? right? So, like, I've usually written them on the higher end, mm -hmm. but now I'm thinking, like, oh, am I, am I actually making it harder for to Final hit the goals. And IEP kids to be successful because I'm holding them to a higher standard than the rest of the kids. M maybe like during the meeting, if you already have the goal in mind, if you're talking to the parent, because I think that's an important kind of component too, is to kind of see what the parent would want in that area too. You know, if the parent would be okay, just like baby steps going 60%, then maybe that's something you can hit for this one and then meet again later in the year to see if you can improve that. I think ideally they, they want that higher number because they want to see those kind of gains be met. And oftentimes, too, it is a, a kind of um, reflection of what's done in the IEPs also, too. Um, in, in Honolulu District, when we have new counselors, every beginning of the year we have a new counselor training. We also have um, uh, training on 504s or for experienced counselors who kind of come back. Like, let's say they've been in middle or high school and not done 504s for years, and then now all of a sudden they have to. So I'm, I'll make sure to let Chris know and he can uh, shoot it out to our, our charter schools, at least here in Oahu or out right into if, if necessary. So um, any, any other questions with, with 504s? Or? The, the 504 process does kind of look like that, right? We take in all these things. The SPED is just much more, much deeper in, in the everything, okay? But we do have some SPED stuff too. If you guys have any even SPED questions, let Chris know and I can follow up with my colleagues on that, okay? Anything else? Okay, thank you.